guys. Welcome back to the Geek Vault, episode four. I'm Dan. With me is Matt. Hello, everybody. It's Matt. Good to be back for episode four. Hope you're all doing well. Who'd have thought? Four weeks. We've actually done it for four weeks so far. I know. We've been very good. We've been keeping on this. And I'm glad people are listening and enjoying it as well. We've been enjoying recording it. So, strong start. We mean to go on. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, who's listened so far. I heard um, that you had some issues yesterday, Matt. Yeah, not but had a great... Well, I say I've not had a great week. Had a, only a bit of an issue yesterday. I don't know about you. I had a bit of a power cut last night, which did not go well. I've been having issues with my internet this week. We're with Virgin, so that's been on the blink, up and down, like a yo-yo. Oh, yeah. We live, like, I don't know, maybe a 30, 40-minute journey away from each other. We both had our internet go down at the exact same time, thanks to Virgin. <laughs> yeah, we just set up to play Warfare. Bang, cuts down. Perfect timing. We literally got into a game, and then it all lagged out, and then uh, the internet went. Yeah, I, we just started the game. And we were doing all right. I think we, we, we would have won that game if we didn't die midway through with the internet. Yeah, sure. It's not been a good week for electronics in general. The internet went down. Like I said, I had my power cut last night. Power went out at maybe about quarter past three. It didn't come back on again until 10 o'clock. And then when it did come back on, it was on for like 10 minutes. Then it turned off again. So I was like, oh, God, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to bed. We were playing like Uno by candlelight. We had to order takeout because we couldn't cook anything. It was a weird night. Having to go old school with like the board games. Yeah. Mum kept recommending, oh, we should play Scrabble. I was like, I'm not playing Scrabble. I don't want to get angry <laughs> you know what you should have played what monopoly no 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 not monopoly i remember once we had like a family barbecue ages back and we played pictionary and we had like a brand new board game version of pictionary and after that game it immediately went into the bin what happened like my uncle was just really annoyed <laughs> he was like you know what this is this is causing too much stress it's going in the bin <laughs> and he threw it in the trash and we never played it again you see in my family we tend to get the board games out at christmas it's like christmas day is board game day basically oh yeah we play a couple of board games we've got loads of them we'll usually end up getting like a board game for christmas and that'll be the board game that we play on Christmas. Yeah, so we buy my younger brother a board game and that's the board game of the day. What'd you get last Christmas? It was Monopoly's Cheaters Edition. Cheaters Edition? Yeah, basically it was a version of Monopoly where the aim of the game is to cheat. So for all you cheaters out there, like my friend Alex, this is your perfect game. How do you cheat? Does the game have ways in it where you're supposed to cheat the way it says you have to cheat? Or do you just cheat wherever way you feel like? So there's set cheats that you can do. So they're in the middle of the board. So for example, steal someone's money or steal someone's property. And when they're on the board, you can do them at any time and you have to wait until the end of someone's go and then you have to go I cheated and then you have to tell them how you cheated but the other players they can catch you out so if they think you're cheating they can go you cheated what if they get you wrong if they get it wrong then they usually get a punishment but if you get away with it you usually get a good reward so maybe you should um try that one out for your next board game day <laughs> yeah, I might keep an eye on that one we have like a, a, a custom monopoly board we got it years ago but it was like a blank opoly then you print off like your own locations and you print off your own like version of Baker Street or whatever or your own like train stations you have your own like pieces and stuff you, you build it however you want which is really weird that does sound like a lot of effort for a game of Monopoly I know <laughs> it's far too much effort I think I'd throw that one in the bin well speaking of things getting thrown in the bin <laughs> it doesn't make any sense <laughs> what have you been up to this week well this week's been it's felt like a long week this week I've gotten back into watching The Office the US version oh yeah it's on Amazon Prime I think we, we talked about it last week about John Krasinski and it kind of just triggered something in me to re-watch it so I'd already like watched the first season like a couple of months ago and like stopped and I picked up from where I left off and now I'm like on season three so I'm I'm in the midst of an office binge oh okay not bad I've never actually watched The Office I might have to give it a go because I always hear conflicting things about the UK one and the US one I'm like I don't know it just doesn't seem to click for me so what I did I watched The Office the UK version first of all and I wasn't really a fan of it it was okay but it, it just didn't hit the, the funny bone for me, really. And then I thought, I have to see what the US version's about. The first season is basically like what all American TV shows do when they try and copy a British show. is a like-for-like -like remake. But the second season, it starts to get into its own element and you get to know more about the characters and it just gets better and better. It finds like its own identity, I suppose. It finds its own rhythm and once it finds it, it just becomes a completely different show and it's so bingeable. Which one do you prefer? The US? or the UK one? The US one. This is like my third time binging it all. Oh, damn. Wow. I might have to watch it. There's nine seasons. Oh, that's a lot. How many episodes are there per season? The first season is like six and then the second season it goes to like, you know, 20, you know, like the J 
general kind of American kind of thing. Oh, uh, like 22, 23 episodes. Yeah, but you just got to get past the first season. It's trying to copy the UK version and it doesn't work. Yeah, I've heard that. There's a lot of like US or American like TV studios or whatever have tried to recreate UK shows. There's the famous one of the um, Inbetweeners when they tried to remake the Inbetweeners. And it's awful. Oh my God, it's God awful. They tried to do it as well with the IT crowd, but they had the same guy who played Moss, Richard Awadi. They had him in the US version of the IT crowd and it was just awful. And he was performing all the same jokes, but you could tell that he didn't like performing the same jokes and it didn't land as well as the original. It's really annoying when they try and like recreate the stuff the British have made but they just do it scene for scene Yeah, and it's like what's the point of doing that we've already got that if you're going to remake it give it your own spin like what The Office US eventually does you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of what we were talking about last week with Tiger King being turned into a film yeah like why bother when you've already got the original that's better and it's true kind of reminds me of that a little bit you don't need to do it waste of time totally agree with you there I just think some remakes are better not done but that's a whole other topic oh yeah that's a whole conversation (laughs) remakes and remakes reboots they go on so what kind of stuff have you been watching this week have you been watching like a lot of tv or films or anything like that well this morning i actually re-watched knives out because you told me you watched it the other week so it kind of got me thinking i need to see it again oh nice is this the second time you've watched it then yeah so i watched it when it came out in the cinema last year and i've been meaning to get around to watching it again but i'm just lazy sometimes it's one of those films i think it's probably a bit harder to watch a second time because the whole thing is based on this murder mystery so once you know what that murder mystery is i kept thinking oh it's probably not going to be as entertaining on a second watch how'd you find it i definitely agree with you there once you know what happens in a film watching it the second time is always a little bit different you kind of get to see bits you might have missed that they've like woven into the film i guess you might have noticed moments where they picked out like this particular piece of evidence or this clue yeah and you would miss it on the first time unless you knew what you were looking for i think i always enjoy watching things that play with your mind and have mystery to it because if you watch it again you already know what's happened so you're watching it with a different mind so you're looking out for different things that you might not have been looking out for in the first time yeah i might have to give it a rewatch because i didn't really like knives out that much honestly what? I tell you what, we t- we talked about Invisible Man last week. Yeah. And I watched Invisible Man and Knives Out back to back. Okay. We watched Invisible Man first and then we watched Knives Out. Really liked Invisible Man. Comparatively, I didn't enjoy Knives Out, honestly. It's very clever and it tries to be this murder mystery type thing. You see Ryan Johnson doing his old subversion of expectations kind of thing in this movie. Yeah. Which works a lot better than uh, in Last Jedi, I tell you that. It does a really good job of sort of building up. It does do a little bit of a subversion. Like it builds the movie up on like one kind of story like it's supposed to be a mystery who done it that type of thing and then about halfway through it stops being that and it starts more being about how this person is supposedly going to get away with it so it kind of changes halfway through which is a bit i don't know it jumps you a little bit it's like you're in for one thing and you're out with another also it starts off with a ton of exposition like i understand that it's got like loads of characters that it needs to sort of get through and understand but honestly there's like the first 20 minutes of it we paused about 15 20 minutes into the movie and we were like i already need to to like take a breather to understand who these people are and, and what's going on and how they're related to each other because there's so many people and half of the relationships between them you don't need to know to understand what's going on in the movie either but you don't know that because it's this whodunit murder mystery so you're trying to take in as much information as you can so we're like oh we've got to pause it for a little bit just to kind of break down what's going on yeah I think some of the characters you could have just cut and you wouldn't have noticed but I just love the murder mystery aspect and I love what it does with the genre it just does its own thing you think you're going one way and it's no we're gonna go this way now but it's really hard to talk about what it did differently without spoiling the film for you so if you haven't seen knives out now's a good chance to pause check the info on the episode for where you can skip to the next bit without spoilers because i need to talk spoilers with you matt all right let's get into it if we break down the film a little bit but from the start i guess it introduces all the characters or whatever you've got walt and you've got um the that's the thing don't remember any of the characters names because they're all introduced so fucking quickly but you've got all these people right <laughs> including the maid uh what's her name marta basically she's the maid of this really rich person he kills himself and it turns out that she's the killer although she's not the killer i guess well, like matt said at the beginning there's a lot of exposition so it's um daniel craig 
Craig's character, Blank, he's interviewing all the family members because the local authority, they see this case as a case closed. They see it as a suicide. Mm. But an anonymous tip sent to Blank, he's a private investigator. So that intrigues him to investigate into this case. So the first kind of 10, well, I say half an hour, really, you're just getting to know the characters and the players and what's happened the night of the murder. A lot goes into that part, though, because it probably goes, like I say, for 15 sort of 20 minutes just interviewing all the characters. Then it jumps into that night of the murder and you just see how that entire night plays out. Then you go back into the interviews until the interview arty. It's Annie Diarmas plays her. Does a very good job. She also has this very, I thought it was quite convenient, weird plot thing where she vomits every time she tries to lie. Conveniently but hilarious. It's, it's ridiculous. But I was like, it would be funny if it wasn't in a movie that relied so much on the murder mystery intrigue. It doesn't really come into play at all. Like, it's it's never really a plot device. The only real thing is when it happens at the end, when she vomits after revealing that the other person died. She's like, oh, she actually died. I was holding in this vomit the whole time. I think, like, the fact that, you know, when it's first introduced, she just pukes, like, she can't stop, she just pukes. But throughout the film, she kind of gets control over it, so she holds in the sick. There's a lot of, like, different plots and different characters all going on at once, and I found it very convoluted and very complicated. Because I, I reckon you could, like I say, you could narrow down this film film and make it a lot more streamlined but I suppose then if you did do that I don't know maybe that would affect the murder mystery because you're not constantly thinking about this bit and this bit and that bit and thinking how it all ties together but then that's not as important because you find out what the true events of what happened that night about halfway through the movie anyway and then it's more about how is she going to get away with this because she's constantly alongside Daniel Craig's character like the entire movie so you're thinking oh and now she's alongside him she can have the opportunity to tamper with evidence like she ruins the tape that shows security footage of her parking and what like that so she ruins that and she's getting rid of footsteps that she left in the garden that kind of thing and she's going along with the detective it's like oh that's actually clever yeah I think that's like I, I really enjoyed that part where she's with him by his side trying to like tamper with the evidence and try and clear her name mm. what essentially happened it's so sad what happened because it's so avoidable oh yeah of course because it shows at the end they have the really long scene like they do in all kind of detective movies where the detective is explaining what's going on he's explaining because he's calling out um what's Chris Evans is character's name ransom Ransom, that's it. Calling out Ransom, who's played by Chris Evans. By the way, does a great job because he's been playing Captain America for God knows how long. This good guy, you know, all is all is good superhero, I'm morally right, into this clearly villain straight away. So props to him. I think what really helped his character is that we just see him as Captain America. So you just don't think Chris Evans has it in him. But oh my God, he is bloody evil. You know what? It's so, I'm going to veer off on a small tangent, but it's so nice now that like the MCU has kind of culminated in Endgame and a bunch of like the main actors are going off and doing their own thing. It's so nice to see that they're still good as other characters. You kind of forget. You don't want them to be typecast as Captain America forever. Yeah. And you forget that Chris Evans is still a bloody good actor in other things where he's not playing Captain America. It's good to see. He was just brilliant. He was one of my favourite characters. I think I've got three favourite characters from the film and that's Daniel Craig, Marta and Chris Evans. Daniel Craig was great although I watched this movie with my parents and um, my dad just kept taking the piss out of his accent <laughs> the voice that he was doing the whole movie KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken it was hilarious it was really, <laughs> it was really funny well, it gets to a point where you can kind of see past it but when it's introduced in the movie especially since you're so used to seeing him as like James Bond or what have you it's a bit like I don't know if you've seen Logan Lucky he's in that as well isn't he yeah with Channing Tatum and another guy Adam Driver and he's got a bit of a weird sort of redneck voice in that as well it always throws me off because I'm used to him sounding a bit more like James Bond but he keeps doing these funny accents for movies so just going back to the point where we were beforehand oh yeah we're talking about knives out veered off a little bit there but the whole kind of the murder is so preventable but it's so brilliantly executed by chris evans yeah because it goes through all this complicated timeline about how he's switching out vials of like medication that she's supposed to give him every night and she gives him what she thinks is the wrong one which effectively got two vials one's the good one one's the bad one chris evans switches the contents of those vials over so the good one is now the bad one the bad one's now the good one she then gives him the medication 
version, but she accidentally gives him the bad one. But it's not the bad one because it's been changed. It's the good one in it. But because they don't know that, they think it's the bad one. And they think, oh, he's going to die in like 10 minutes. And they come up with this really convoluted plan to get her out. And then he ends up slitting his own throat. But turns out he was absolutely fine. Wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. It's completely avoidable. If they called, you know, that they were chatting about in that scene, if they called an ambulance or anything like that, it would have been absolutely fine. Or I did find it suspicious anyway that they were saying, oh, in 10 minutes you'll be dead. In five minutes you'll be paralyzed. And the scene goes on for more than like five minutes. She even leaves and comes back and he's still like in his own mindset and he knows that he's about to slit his own throat. It's like, I don't think you are unwell. I don't think you are going to die because you're clearly not actually having any kind of side effects from it. To think that Harlan, who was a murder mystery writer, didn't realise that, you know, wait, nothing's happening. I'm, I'm still okay. The, the whole scene kind of felt a lot longer than 10 minutes with what's happened in it. Yeah, I think that's the moments of the film where I didn't quite like it. There was a bit too many points where it tried to be really clever but by changing the story and changing what you know like every 20 minutes it felt like every 20-30 minutes there was some new scene that popped up to re-explain a scene you'd already seen before so instead of seeing the story progress you keep seeing flashbacks to oh this really happened go forward or go back oh this really happened so it's like you're watching like two or three movies in one because they all sort of diverge in different paths but then it all culminates at the end and ties together and hey actually this is what really happened so it's like oh, what the hell happened in this movie because <laughs> that's how I got really confused and complicated because I'm like I don't actually know what really happened because they keep going back and changing what supposedly happened so yeah it all threw me a bit off personally I liked that I liked what they did with it I liked how they kind of told the story basically the character would lie and then it would show you the scene of what actually happened and that was kind of like the main theme throughout the film is that you'd see something that was not right and it would go back and show what happened as they were explaining it to kind of give you context so I can see why it might be confusing but I personally really enjoyed that there is one distinct bit that I laughed the hell at, which was the ending, which absolutely invigorated, like, it just annoyed me. Just annoyed me a little bit too much. He goes to stab her, right? It's all revealed and they've caught ransom and, and you know, you're going to jail, bloody bloody, he's like, I don't know, YOLO or what have you. In for a penny, out for a pound. That's it, yeah. There's this big sort of collection of knives and he's like, oh, you know what, screw it. And he just grabs one of the knives and he jumps towards her to stab her in front of all the police. And it's a slidey knife, a fake knife that slides into its holster. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That was ridiculous. Why would you have a fake slidey knife in midst with all of these other blades? And he just so happens to pull out the fake one? I was like, that made no sense. That absolutely made no sense. That's why the movie broke me right at the end there. <laughs> I was like, that's so stupid. I watched it this morning, so I think he does mention he can't tell the difference between a real knife or a prop knife because he's got so many different variants. I just thought the convenience of him pulling out the, you know, the one prop knife out of the hundred real knives that are all displayed on this, like, shrine or what have you in the middle of the room. And he jumps towards it as a sliding knife. I was like, that's absolutely ridiculous. You didn't need to do that. You just did it for a bit of false tension for no reason at all. I just thought that was funny. Although the very ending shot where she's sipping out of the drink, she's sipping out of the mug, staring down the balcony at everybody. I love that. It says my house across the end of the mug. I think that was a really nice way to end it. We can't not talk about the sliding knife knife scene without talking about what happens seconds before that when Ma pukes in Chris Evans face yeah she throws up over Chris Evans I've never laughed so hard like oh it was, it was disgusting but hilarious at the same time it was that whole like two to three minute sequence <laughs> it was just really funny for some reason it stopped being this like really complicated murder mystery and started being I'm gonna vomit on you and then he's gonna stab you with a fake knife <laughs> so, what what's going on I think that's what I really liked about it it didn't chuck another spanner into the work like oh this is what really happened all along it was quite a, a simple ending in the end mm, i did like the ending and how it all wrapped up it was decent i don't know how quickly i'd watch it again like you say i don't know if it's better upon a second watch because you get to look out for those clues and things that you wouldn't know if you're watching it for the first time yeah i've given it like a few months so give it a while and go back to it and see what you think but overall if i was to give this a rating out of 10 i think it hits a nine for me a nine really it kept me entertained and I just love a good murder mystery and the fact that it was a murder mystery but it did something completely different that I didn't expect it to do it made me love the film more and the majority of the cast were excellent like a lot of them you, you've seen them in other stuff and they they just had a lot of fun you could tell they're having a lot of fun with these roles because this family was just a bunch of arseholes <laughs> money makes people's arseholes 
I'm debating between probably a six, maybe a seven. Like, I didn't enjoy it clearly as much as you. I think there are other films that have better murder mystery plots in them and they're better executed and it's more kind of focused on that rather than trying to be overly complicated and introduce all these characters that ultimately do nothing to it. You know, it's, it stops being the movie that you want about halfway through to be a different movie than to just go back to that movie at the end for the reveal. And I don't know if I like that as much as just a standard whodunit murder mystery. I'm not going to rush to rewatch it but maybe in I don't know a few months or so I'll probably try rewatching it but yeah six or seven well you might not rush to rewatch it but you're definitely going to see more of this world more of Daniel Craig as blank because it's been confirmed that a sequel is in the works to focus on another mystery with Daniel Craig's character of course there is it's like Columbo isn't it he's just going to have his own like sequence of movies where he's going off like figuring out different detective oh that's not too bad actually I quite like that idea I really enjoyed Daniel Craig in that film and I'd love to see him play that character more yeah probably one of my favourite characters if it's a sequel that is just him and I don't want to see any other characters from this family or whatever in a sequel then that could be interesting I would like to see it as it's Daniel Craig going off to a completely different place with a completely different mystery to be solved with completely different characters that could be quite fun I don't necessarily want it to tie in with the first as much or much more than that yeah I don't think it will I think we'll see more of Daniel Craig in investigating mysteries that might not do with murder yeah that could be quite good so speaking of knives out which had chris evans in you mentioned already like i said good to see all the mcu characters go into like different movies and stuff and another film that we both watched this week is extraction with chris hemsworth which is the big movie we want to talk about this week so that's obviously thor he's got his own movie now he's like a a, a military guy what did you think of this movie i watched it last night and it's really good action wise i love the action sequences Oh, the action sequences are so good. But I don't think I liked it that much. Really? Yeah, man. I mean, the action is insane. I loved a lot of what they did to film the action, but I didn't really care much for the story, to be honest. It's a good film, but action-wise, but I think it could have been a lot better. See, I really liked it, actually. I liked the simple story, and it developed more about the characters and the characters' connection. Because it's effectively... The movie's called Extraction, so it's effectively about Chris Evans. He's this rugged, sort of, military dude trying to extract this kid from this drug lord battle effectively one drug lord has kidnapped another drug lord's son and chris evans is sent in to try to get him out and extract him from the whole situation and i like that it's a simple premise and a simple plot going forward and it just throws a ton of action at it which is incredible action by the way we talked about i think in a previous podcast the one yeah the one shot that's in this film the first like major action sequence in this movie is that one and i timed it it starts at 35 minutes into the movie and it ends at 46 minutes it's an 11 minute one shot there's two car chases, gunfight, a knife fight, a brawl, just a fist fight, all in that one sequence. It does end quite disappointingly with a big CG explosion, but otherwise it's great. I think the action is top notch, but I just wasn't that interested. I found the character dynamic between Chris Hemsworth's character is called Tyler and the boy that he's trying to protect is Ovi, I think it is. Yeah. They've got a really good sort of connection between the two of them. They've got great chemistry. It introduces this backstory of Tyler and like the relationships and character, whatever that he has that connects very strongly with Ovi there's a particular scene granted it is quite late into the movie I think it's just before the third act where they're kind of talking in a bedroom getting really emotional and Ovi's asking Tyler a lot of like personal questions about his backstory and about you know how he got to the position that he's in it's such a good scene I'm not gonna lie I got teary eyed really? yeah I thought it was a really good connection it was quite heavy handed in terms of exposition it was quite clear that Chris Evans had just walked into this room sat down to give a lot of information about his backstory and then he got up and left again so it's quite heavy handed in the way that it was delivered or, or the way it was written to be delivered but the way they acted it and the chemistry between them I really love that I love the connection between him and that kid and it just gets escalated at the end I think Chris Hemsworth was brilliant I felt like he was unleashing his inner John Wick but apart from that really it didn't really have a lot going for it for me before we go into spoilers because I think that's where we, this is heading what would you give this out of 10? I think a 5 5 out of 10 it's good action I love the action I'd watch it again if I had a couple of beers because it'd be brilliant but I wouldn't be in a rush to watch it again what about you see i'd probably give this a strong seven maybe up to an eight but definitely a strong seven i really liked the action i really liked the story i really liked the characters there were bits about the ending that we'll get into in a second that i don't really like yeah but everything else as a whole i thought was absolutely great there was other characters as well that could have been fleshed out a bit more because there were like other
other characters on his team, I suppose, at the beginning of the movie, which were very expendable. Like I say, you didn't really know their names or anything like that. There were other side characters, like villain characters, that were just villains to be the sake of villains, which again could have been expanded on way more. They didn't do anything with them, but no, I really like this movie. Well, with that said, let's jump into spoilers. So the first thing is, I guess, the story. So Tyler is, you know, Chris Evans, he's trying to extract this kid from a drug lord. One of the drug lords is the main villain, who I think is not great, but he's good enough for being a villain. But it's far more interesting, one of the kids that he recruits to be villainous for him, it's a kid called Farhead. Do you remember him? Yeah, I hated him. Yeah, you hate him. (laughs) There's a reason I hate him. Is it the reason that the movie wants you to hate him, or did you just hate him being the villain? Oh, I just, I think the movie definitely made me hate him. I think he was a little brat. Yeah, a little brat, to say it politely. But I think that's that's the good thing, because there's the, there's the big drug lord villain of the movie, who is not really very scary or intimidating at all. Honestly, he looks like a Bollywood backup dancer. <laughs> He's not a scary looking guy. But he gets this kid, Farhad, and like recruits him, I suppose, to be a bad guy. And he is a bad kid. And he is an asshole. And he does a really good job of portraying it. And I like that, because it's established uh, later in the movie Tyler Chris Hemsworth's character he used to have a kid he had a kid about six years old or what have you and he died from cancer whilst he was out serving he was on his third tour what have you voluntarily he eats himself up at the fact that he voluntarily left his family and when he did that his kid died and that's why he has this strong protection over Ovi in the film to you know, extract him and get this kid out of it he's just it shows him at the beginning of this film this kid is just at school he's hanging out with his friends he's trying to get the nerve to talk to girls he's just this kid he just happens to be the kid of a drug lord and gets involved in all of this so that immediately builds up that connection between the, those two characters for me and it's nice that he's told like various times around the film oh just get out leave the kid behind and he doesn't because he's got that sort of past that makes him want to save Ovi yeah and I really like that but then on the equal side of that you've got the villain Farhad who's been recruited he's a kid as well he's been recruited by the bad guy there's an action scene later in the film which I really liked where Farhad and his group of kids try to go up and take down Chris Hemsworth and take down Tyler and they've got guns and of course he doesn't want to kill the kids whether they're bad guys or not he's got this like moral compass where he doesn't want to kill children and they're trying to kill him and Farhad is trying to kill him and it just it's this great action sequence of Chris Hemsworth just <laughs> decking kids really throwing them against the vans or picking one up and just using him to, as a bat to hit another person <laughs> and it's really funny but it's complicated because they will they've already been shown as earlier in this film as they will kill without hesitation but of course Tyler won't and I like that dynamic it changes a little bit towards the end of the movie but I think that's really great yeah I I, I get what you're saying there but I think the connection between Chris Hemworth character and Ovi I think you know that did build up as the film went along but it, it just didn't impact me as much as I thought it would I didn't feel that connection see I felt the opposite I felt that connection was really strong and I kind of felt it was like a father son kind of dynamic and I thought I was great and it was really well done don't know how it had such a difference on uh, me compared to you it's crazy isn't it like I said I think the action was great the cinematography was really good the colour of the film I loved all that but where it fell flat was the story it just felt like a very generic story to me it didn't feel quite as generic for me because of the characters I suppose like it is a simple story and it is quite easy to get the grip of it's a bit like John Wick in that sense like John Wick is a very simple story it's just trying to get revenge from his dead dog or what have you. This is a very simple story of him just trying to get this kid out and it adds like layers of why he cares about this kid so much in terms of the character. So that's kind of what adds to it a little bit more. But I quite like that. I think at the end there was really great tension when the sniper was shooting at them on the bridge. Yes. And the Wanna scene and the, the scene on the bridge, that was just insane. They are really good. Because the film opens up near the end with Chris Hemsworth on the bridge battling what feels like an entire arm me and there's a sniper taking people connected with Chris Hemsworth out and you just knew it was only going to end one way for him. One thing I didn't like actually about that was at the very beginning of the movie you see a shot of him on that bridge and it's like him running he's obviously massively injured or wounded or what have you and he's running and he ducks down by a car and then that cuts to like two days earlier and I felt that was a big mistake you didn't need that at all you could have just started the movie right at two days earlier rather than showing him on the bridge because the second you show him on the bridge it was like oh I feel like I know where this is heading. There's not going to be any kind of tension until we get to that bridge moment. Yeah. You don't need it. It was a shot that was completely unnecessary. It didn't add anything to the story going forward. You didn't gain anything from seeing that shot or that small little scene first before you then go into the rest of the movie. You just did not need that. I like it when they do those kind of scenes, but sometimes it just 
doesn't feel right. Yeah, sometimes it works, but there it just it just wasn't necessary. It didn't add anything to it. Because there are like a few scenes throughout this film. Like there's even a guy called Grasper, who's bloody the guy from Stranger Things. David Harbour. David Harbour, that's it. Hellboy. <laughs> He's in this movie for like a scene. I feel like he was just a convenient plot point. Yeah, he was just a convenient plot point. I do agree with that. That wasn't a great scene. That's during the, I guess, during the sequence where they have that close connection chat whilst Tyler and Obi are in the bedroom and they chat about the backstories and what have you. But the whole purpose of him being there wasn't very good. And it reminded me a lot of, I actually watched a movie earlier this week, The Island, that old Michael Bay movie. Yeah. I don't know why I watched that earlier. And that scene in Extraction reminded me a lot of a scene from The Island where he's, it was so obvious that he was going to betray him. Like, there was a moment where he's like sitting at a table chatting to um, Chris Hemsworth. And he's like, oh, don't you worry. Um, you can stay here for as long as you can. I just got to head out and see the wife, bloody blah, blah, back in a bit. And the way it's acted really feels like a scene from the island where he's saying, oh yeah, we'll just go out in a bit. Don't you worry. We're going to go to the news and we'll sort this all out. And it's very obvious that he's about to betray them. Yeah, you could see it coming a mile off. Exactly. So that kind of ruined it a bit. Like you didn't really need him there. It was a bit more of a plot convenience. I think like if they'd have cut that bit out, they could have focused on more of him trying to get out of the city because essentially the drug lord who's kidnapped the other drug lord's son he has control of the entire city so as soon as he knows that tyler has ov he shuts everything down and everyone that works the police the military is on the hunt for tyler and ov and i think it just gave a little bit of respite but we could have seen a bit more of them trying to escape really because it must have been horrific like imagine you're in a city and you can't escape because everyone's trying to get you you get a sense for that in the first action scene that wanna which is really good, where they're constantly running from one set piece to another, and it's the one shot which is just following with them the entire time. I thought that did that quite well, but beyond that one scene, on that one sequence, wasn't really a lot more that it added to add to that idea of being chased. It's almost they like added just a throwaway line halfway through the movie saying, oh yeah, he's got the police force in his pocket. Yeah. And that means, oh, it's absolutely okay for you to go around killing police officers in the city now. Don't you worry. They're all bad guys. <laughs> so you've got loads of enemies to kill. Not a problem. Don't worry about it. So it was quite convenient unlimited red shirts exactly <laughs> but the fight scene on the bridge at the end was really good there's even the um the other fighter the other sort of chris hemsworth if you will ovi's dad is a drug lord a friend of that drug lord is the other military guy who's trying to hunt down ovi or not hunt down ovi but get him and save him a bit like chris hemsworth and they kind of fight against each other for that one shot sequence and then they team up near the end of the movie to get onto the bridge and i loved his character obviously we're in spoils already but he dies at the end of the movie it was such a good death but they didn't develop his character enough i don't think to make that death like really hit although it was super sudden and very john wick-esque you didn't see it coming which i did love they spent like a little bit of time like showing you a bit of his backstory but if they got rid of the whole david harbour bit they could have spent a bit more time developing a little bit more true actually yeah that could have worked quite well i think his name Saju, the other guy when he gets hit by a truck did you laugh out loud yes i did <laughs> that was so funny it was so comedic the timing of that the truck comes into frame and knocks him out the other side of the frame it's like you're watching roadrunner or something it was just really really funny and I don't think it was meant to be. I feel like if that truck hit me, I'd still be on the floor like a week later, like I'm not getting up from that. Yeah, there's so many moments where some insane action happens to someone and you think, well, they should be dead. <laughs> they do not survive that and of course they get up. A bit like the ending of the movie. Should we talk about that real quick? Yeah, let's go there. Like I say, I love this movie, but I did not like the ending. Like the whole ending battle on the bridge was really cool and he's getting Ovi to, effectively you're on one side of the bridge, which is in the city and they're trying to get them to the other side of the bridge where the extraction helicopter is to get them out to safety. And they're, I don't know, maybe halfway across the bridge at this point and Chris Hemsworth has taken a lot of beatings and a lot of bullets and he's like oh god run over you run get to the other side and he like turns around and starts walking down back down the bridge for no reason shooting police officers and whatever he's trying to kill him it's like a Terminator kind of esque kind of like come at me yeah he is very Terminator he's holding like an assault rifle in each hand <laughs> he is very Terminator just walking down it for no reason kid's already safe at this point he's already like with his team the other side of the bridge next to the helicopter and they've got him safe but no he still in there like shooting everybody for the sake of shooting everybody but then out of nowhere Farhad the kid turns up the kid who he didn't want to kill earlier in that movie with the uh, fight sequence and all the kids comes up and shoots him in the neck but he kills him doesn't he it's absolutely brutal I hated that kid I hated that kid I did like that it was that kid who killed him when I was watching that and I saw him turn around I already knew it was that kid he was going to shoot him I was like it's got to be it's the only thing that makes sense they set it up early in the movie as well because they were like oh I'm going to kill him yeah and then 
then of course he does at the end but i think the biggest thing that i have a problem with is right at the very end of course chris hemsworth dies so he gets shot in the neck right and he falls off the bridge into the water and you're supposed to think oh he's dead and i believe he's dead there's no way any man goes through that kind of punishment and brutality then gets shot in the neck and then spends that long in the bottom of the ocean to be alive after all that it's absolutely ridiculous and story wise it makes sense that he should die because he's gone out of his way and given his life to save the kid that he could save when he couldn't save his own kid like it all wraps up quite nicely that he should die in that moment that should be his final like you know heroic victory but then at the very end of the movie there's this like teaser shot of Ovi swimming in a pool and this figure standing behind him blurry and you're supposed to think oh it's him Tyler he's alive but no he should be dead he should not be back like that I think that actually ruins the whole sacrifice and meaning of the ending battle it's absolutely gone if you bring him back at the end of the movie I get your point there but I think the way it was shot this is what I think that he's dead he definitely died there's no way he's surviving that it's like a guardian angel kind of thing Ovi has someone looking over him now from above maybe it's like Ovi's just having like a bit of PTSD and he imagines that he's still there watching over him because I think it's supposed to set up the idea at the very beginning of the movie the way Tyler is introduced he just jumps off of a cliff into water and he just sits at the bottom of the water meditating or what have you yeah and that's what Ovi does again at the end of the movie he jumps to the swimming pool and sits at the bottom before coming up and seeing the blurry Chris Hemsworth in the background but then I think it's supposed to imply that when he fell off the bridge and he was all shot up he didn't die he just went to the bottom of the riverbed and stayed down there for a long period of time I think that's what they're going to imply if they make a sequel which there are talks of them potentially making a sequel which I don't know if I want to see as much as I love him I don't want Chris Hemsworth in it because his character should be dead I think the only way they can go forward is a prequel I 110% believe he's dead if he survived that then I don't know how because he got the shit kicked out of him a prequel would be quite good double down on the character development and maybe have a prequel set during his third tour when he's supposedly out fighting whatever battle he's fighting whilst his kid is dying back at home you know and see how he actually goes through that and how he handles that that could be a quite a good prequel movie I'd recommend giving it a watch you know it wasn't my kind of cup of tea the action was amazing the way some of the scenes were shot you just need to watch it for that I think yeah I agree I really liked it I think for me the story and the characters were very interesting and very compelling to watch or at least the main ones were anyway and then the action on top of that is just absolutely fantastic it's got that very John Wick-esque oh the story is pretty simple but the action's really good so I think it's worth watching it if you enjoy John Wick I reckon you'll enjoy this although you know you might not if you're Dan but I think it's definitely worth watching and deciding for yourself because I think everyone's going to have a different take I think some people walk away from it being oh it's a really good action movie some people you know I'm kind of in that walk away I was a bit, it's quite a good character movie so yeah ultimately I would say check out this movie it's pretty decent in the meantime I found a few news stories over the week there's only a few here some that I thought would be quite interesting one of them is actually one that I already sent you it's a very sad story honestly Irfan Khan I think that's how I'm pronouncing his name the actor he was inspired the amazing Spider-Man and Jurassic World has sadly passed away at the age of 53 that's really sad he died in Mumbai after being admitted to hospital with a colon infection earlier this week. It's a, a rare form of cancer, unfortunately. But um, he was great. I thought he was fantastic. He, I loved him in Jurassic World. He really brought life to that character he was in there. I really remember him from Jurassic World. Like you said, he brought a lot of life to that character. He's also in Life of Pi. I don't know if you've seen that, but he was absolutely brilliant in that as well. And it's so sad to hear that he's passed away. He was in some great like, big movies, but unfortunately, um, not anymore. It's a shame, really. Some good news. You might have already heard this. Disney are working on a live action Hercules movie. They're remaking Hercules as a live action movie with the Russo brothers attached as producers. I feel like as soon as you said live action Hercules, my eyes rolled. But then you said the Russo brothers. Okay, I'm listening. That's the thing. I'm torn apart on this because it's another Disney live action remake, which I have honestly, I've not watched any of them because I have no interest in them. Maybe I'll have to watch them and maybe we could do an episode comparing them. I get what you mean. I've watched the Lion King remake and they didn't need that. But the Aladdin remake, I actually quite enjoyed that. I'd recommend giving that a go. I know you've got Disney Plus, so it's on there. Oh, but it's got the Will Smith genie, isn't it? I imagine that's just cringy as hell. <laughs> Give it a go because it's different to the original animation a little bit. And I really loved it. When it first got released and Will Smith was being the genie, I was like, no, no one can ever replace Robin Williams. No. But it doesn't do that. Will Smith is his own genie and it's a different kind of film i'd recommend having a go 
see what you think. Maybe I'll give it a watch. I'm not entirely sure. Like I say, I just don't have any interest in watching any of the Disney live action remakes. And to me, the Aladdin one is just another remake. It's no different from the Jungle Book one or Cinderella one. Or Have they done a Cinderella one? I don't know how many they've done. It's ridiculous. I agree. Like, why are they doing the remakes? They should look at original content. But some of the remakes are actually all right. But The Lion King, nah. And one last little piece of news. This is actually hilarious, by the way. I'll warn you now. This is um, just ridiculous. So, Sony's Spider-Man universe now actually has an official name for it. So, Sony Studios has officially named their Spider-Man universe. Do you want to make any kind of guess <laughs> as to what it's called? Not coming home? No. It's nothing good. It's, I'll tell you that. Think so you've got the MCU. You've got the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've got the DCEU. Oh, the universe name. Okay. Yeah, they've revealed what they're going to call, what Sony are going to call their Spider-Man universe. I feel like they should go with the Spider-Verse, but I feel like they haven't. Yeah, everybody has been saying that, funnily enough. <laughs> Everybody's saying Spider-Verse. Call it some kind of take on Spider-Verse. But it's not. It is called the SPUMC. S. P-U-M-C. Yeah, it can be reduced down to the S-U-M-C, Sony's Universe of Marvel Characters. That's the name of their universe, Sony's Universe of Marvel Characters, or Sony Pictures Universe of Marvel Characters. <laughs> so the S-P-U-M-C. I've just got one thing to say there. What? Give the rights back to Marvel. It's so stupid. It's such a ridiculous name. That sounds absolutely stupid. Oh, I can't wait for the next movie in the S-P-U-M-C. <laughs> it's just not a good title. It's a description. It's not a title. Sony's Universe of Marvel Characters. That's apparently going to cover movies like Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage, which was um, announced recently. Uh, Morbius, maybe a potential um, Craven the Hunter movie and going on in the future, that kind of thing. It's going to encapsulate all of them. They definitely missed the trick with Spider-Verse. Come on. Spider-Verse rolls off the tongue. And a lot of other people are agreeing. But yeah, a lot of people say, do some kind of spin on Spider-Verse. But that's that's what they decided to call it. And that's how they're going to referred to it so far going forward just sounds ridiculous i'm not gonna lie so that's an acronym that i'm gonna forget by tomorrow anyway so until then i think that's probably a good point to wrap it up so thank you guys so much for listening if you want to find out any information or time codes for this episode there will be a link in the description plus a link to our website where you can listen to future episodes and ones that we've already put out if you have any suggestions any feedback tweet us at geek vault pod on twitter so if you want to let us know how we're doing or if you've got any suggestions for future episodes do let us know and uh, in the meantime I hope you have a good week and we'll see you next week yeah guys thanks very much for listening if you've enjoyed the episode today share it with a friend and we'll see you next week